when I was lucky to find a master whom I refer to as a great master, many other people refer to him as a great master, a man with a beautiful white beard. I loved his face and I loved his beard. But more than all, I loved his love for me and for others. So full of love. And he shared everything in such a childlike way. Because when he found I was a child, he became a child and talked to me like a child. So I would understand and appreciate and go along with him and try out what he was saying. If he talked like a grown-up, I wouldn't have listened to him. But as he taught me the secret of the sound current and how it can open your inner doors and let you have a full knowledge of your own true self and lead to self-realization and ultimately God-realization, which is just one small step ahead of self-realization. Then he taught this. He said a very beautiful thing to me. He said, I am sharing this with you because my master shared it with me and it worked for me. I hope it works for you. If not, try something else. And in any case, go and look around. If there is something that works better than this, try other yogas and see if uh, anything else works better. If anything else takes you further than what I have shown you, or anything else describes something better than what I have shown you, take it. Accept it. Don't come to me to take my permission. I give you my permission in advance. Go and accept it first. Then please do come back and tell me so that I may also go and accept. It. These were the instructions of my master to me about the practice of different kinds of yoga. I took him very seriously. If I were grown up, I might have ignored it that this is just a way of saying I know the truth. Nobody else does. I didn't take it like that. I thought he meant it seriously that I should go and investigate what kind of yoga, what kind of promises people are making and what is actually practical, practically possible. So I carried out to the letter what he told me and met more yogis, more swamis, more gurus than anybody else that I know of all over the world. And as I met them and I listened to them and I saw their yoga and saw their practice, I must confess to you today, I have not succeeded in doing that which he said, if I do, I should go back to him. So I'm still on my search to find something that takes us higher. Not only did I not find anybody giving me a means and a yogic sadhana to go beyond what he taught me, I have not come across anybody even describing what is beyond that. The description was so hard. Therefore, what I am sharing with you, I must tell you, is very rare. And I have been to all the countries and 65 times around the world, it means some travel. And to travel so much, to meet so many people, especially so-called practitioners who are trying to practice self, self-realization, that what I am sharing is what I got from my master. I hope it works for you. And if not, try something better. With this introduction, I hope you will agree that it's time to try to actually go within and not merely talk about. Are you all ready for a little exercise in which we may see how the human body is a temple, living temple? To consider that the human body is a living temple and to get results out of it, I want to tell you at the outset, you have to treat it like a temple. I don't know if you have done it today or you will do it tomorrow, but uh, we have grown up with some notions of temples and churches and holy places. We have to use those notions on the body. Even an ordinary house, we like to keep it clean, vacuum. And the church we want to keep so nice and neat, house of God. And we don't even speak loudly, we whisper. Because it is, it is a sanctuary, it is a sacred place. We should treat this body like that sacred place. If we want to go within it like a mansion. But if we are trying to put all kinds of junk into the mouth. And all kinds of dirty and foul thoughts into the head and using this body to swear and fight and be vulgar and violent, let's not think we are ready yet for going with it. We have to correct this, uh, this uh, error in using the body 
as a just a physical means of existence and use it like a temple and give it respect and sanctity. If we do that to the body, then we are ready. Then the results will come. They will not come otherwise. If you are using the body like that, we will not be able to assume it is a temple. <clears throat> what we are going to do is to draw our attention, which is the only part of consciousness that we can control. Consciousness is aware of so many things, we don't control it. We put attention here or there is what we control. Attention is the only part of consciousness that we can control at any time. Therefore, what we are going to do is to use our attention not to go here or there, but to attend to ourselves, to put the attention in the head from where it is going out. Now we know in the head its attention is going. We look at the flag. It goes from the head through the eyes to which we look to the flag. We shut our eyes. Attention is still on the flag without the eyes. It's still flowing directly. And we know we are conscious of the flag inside our head because of the attention still held on the flag. This is the way the attention flows. It has been flowing like this all these years outside. Now we are going to stop this. And instead of looking at the flag, we are going to look at who was looking at the flag. Where was the attention going out from? Where does it operate from? Is it inside the head? You can experiment for yourself individually. Where does it operate from? Does it operate from the heart, from the neck, from the eyes, from the top of the head, from the ears? You can do it yourself. But I can give you a shortcut just to cut your time schedule. That after you have done all this, you will find it is in wakeful state flowing from a spot behind the eyes. And like these two fingers, if these are the eyeballs and they meet in the center, so much backwards in the head at a point behind the eyes is where apparently we are operating from. From where we join the two visions of the two eyeballs, the two pupils, the vision picked up by the retinas is joined to become one vision. And where we operate from, if we were one, one spot, supposing we were only one millimeter big and we wanted to know where are we in the body, we would find that over there we could figure out that the ears are on either side. The throat is below us, the head is above us, the eyes are in front of us, the back of the head is behind us. So we can locate ourselves where we are operating from in the wakeful state by this exercise. But uh, when we go to sleep, we are not there, we drop. If we are half asleep, feeling a little sleepy during meditation, while fully awake, we can say, here are the eyes, because we feel we are looking out from the eyes, even with the eyes closed. If we are half asleep, we say, here are the eyes, we'll touch the nose. You can try. We'll touch somewhere near the nose. Because this level is not permanent. It drops according to our level of consciousness. As we go into the dreamy state, it drops. When we are seeing a dream unconscious of the body, we are in the throat. When we are feeling there are no dreams, we forget our dreams, we have gone down to the heart. So this apparent location of wakeful consciousness is right behind the eyes in the wakeful state. But we want to examine and experience reality while we are awake, not while we are sleeping. Therefore, while awake, we try to figure out who we are, where we are. And this body is like our mansion. And this body has a six floors. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it's got more floors above, I think. But we are right now at the sixth floor. We don't have to go to the lower floors and catch an elevator again to come back, like many of the Rishi Munis and Yogis did, to take the soul down by the spine or by thought process to the bottom and then go chakra by chakra upwards. You don't have to do that. You're already wake, awake. So stay at the wakeful point behind the eyes and figure out what are you doing. So in the first exercise, which we'll do now, we do nothing but figure out who we are and are we in the head and figure out where are we. Are we capable of seeing, touching, tasting, smelling inside the head? Can we turn around? Are we so identifying with the body that even when we feel imaginatively that we are behind the eyes, we cannot turn? either side? Can we turn backwards and see the back of our head, even imaginatively? These are the questions we are going to explore in the first exercise. Close your eyes, sit comfortably. You know that the, in, in yoga, they recommend a asana. Asana means a posture. 
different postures have been recommended and some people think that there must be something magical about the posture it's not that magical there is some advantage some but i wouldn't call it magic i would call it an advantage of a particular posture the different postures that the yogis adopted while meditating in the caves in india from where they many books have been written about 84 normal postures for meditation those were designed to give you exercise and they were called yogic postures to give you exercise in a very small confined place you could sit in a cave and exercise all the muscles of the body just by changing your position and so those postures which came to be known as yoga in this country they forgot about the real purpose and the exercise became yoga and those postures are merely designed to exercise in a confined space you are not in a confined space you don't have to follow all those postures that posture is good for the exercise we are going to do in which you are comfortable enough so that your attention does not go to any discomfort or pain in the body and you are uncomfortable enough not to go to sleep that is the right posture for each one of us mostly i find you can sit on a chair upright with your hands in front or on the sides on the legs and that is a fairly comfortable posture and your being upright will keep you sufficiently awake if you go to sleep you can wake up again practice will help you in this sit in this comfortable posture close your eyes forget about the world forget about what is happening in front of you forget about what is happening anywhere else explore what is happening inside the head begin how many of you were able to easily go within and stay in the head and feel you are in the middle of the head please raise your hand thank you how many of you had difficulty going inside and staying in the head thank you those who had difficulty may like to ask any questions about the difficulty they had anybody yes um previously identified the uh So, as the listener, and the mind is the speaker. If the soul is listening to the shadow, well, before we we say human is when the the soul listens to the mind say the word. Human. But in this exercise, we were not dealing with that. Did you have difficulty just being in the center of the head? Well, thinking about that. No. Uh, anybody who had difficulty in centering in the head and having difficulty, yes. So basic mind wandering and not being able to focus. Did it wander all the time, or no. it let you come and then wander away? Well, when I realized it was wandering, then I. Could. You'd come back. How long did it let you have your own way, and how long did it let you uh, pull you out? Um, there was. It was longer me having focusing than wandering. Okay, but the wandering of the mind was the only thing that took you away. Otherwise, you had no problem being right. there. Otherwise, yeah. You could feel you were in the head. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I uh, just fully really realizing that I am uh, focused inside, as as reference to as is this my mind thing. you're inside or are you inside i can i don't know if i can make myself clear <laughs> but did you put this question have this conversation within yourself yes i did <laughs> and you knew that conversation was going on yes you heard it heard it no you I didn't mean, hear this conversation that that here uh, uh how did you know it took place <laughs> That's a difficult question to answer. It's just like uh, uh, no. I am trying to make it experimental. I am not trying to uh, not theory about what happens. I am trying to put you in touch with who heard. I am just trying to put you in touch with a question to yourself: Who heard the thought? This thought came to me. Is this mind doing it? Somebody heard it inside, not outside, right? Where? Where did you hear this? Is this the mind putting me on? Where did you hear this? if you can do that that's where you are inside it's only introspection on this question will take you to the right location in the next exercise while this question is being put and you are thinking about it 
at that time pause where am i thinking and listening to this thought and you'll find your location in the next exercise try okay yes i found that uh, uh, i would actually lose consciousness sometimes of being aware of myself of the body you mean no i no Conscious i would get caught up in the in the thought and then lose the fact that i that you are doing this exercise yes. but the thoughts were still there something was there you shifted from the exercise to thoughts yes the thoughts you take you what you were thinking about yeah but without my realizing it something but could you pull back yes how often did you have to pull back in this few minutes exercise uh do you feel that with practice you could uh, control this wandering with thoughts and stay a little longer okay we'll try it. we are going to do it, do it again a little while so try and hold it and see how long you can hold still before thoughts take you away and when they take you away you you pull back again how quickly you can uh, how quickly you can how quickly you can pull back sometimes you lose you lose the fact that you think it exactly it is it's immediately after the fact you realize the thought took you away yeah when the thought has taken you away you don't feel you have gone away that's true it's later on you find how quickly you were able to recover Yes. When I first went in, I had no problem staying there. I saw an image. I've often seen images when I go in, and and but then thought it took me away. But then I was conscious to come back, but I didn't see any image. Okay. So I was kind of going back. When you see an image, you see the image in front of. You. Is that right? If the image is in front of you, you are at a distance from the image. Not too much of a distance. Not too much, but. don't let that distance narrow stay back from the image next time you see the image stay back because if you look at the image and follow it you get into thoughts immediately i'm giving you a little trick on this business that what you see and what happens is good if you stay in the center when an image comes and you follow the image it takes you into thoughts and you are no longer in the center it is a real real no it doesn't matter whatever it is even an unreal image that pulls you anything moving in front any looking like a cloud moving or a darkness moving or some color coming up or some image coming up in front when you start looking at it and move away from your center then other thoughts immediately take over if you don't move pull back and say let me watch from here i won't go any further then the thoughts don't come and you remain in the center so handle these images by not following them yes Does not following them mean the same thing as not focusing on them? Yes. Don't focus. Watch. Can you watch something without focusing on it? Can you? No problem. When you focus on a thing, supposing an image is moving on a wall or a screen like this, when you focus on it, you look at it as it moves and you turn along with it. That's focusing on it. But where am I watching this from? Focus your thought on that question. Where am I that I can watch this screen move along, and that will bring you back to yourself. Should you try to keep the same image? No, no. Shouldn't worry about the image. Let it change. Let it go. Yes. I, I, I doing the uh, the exercise. I noticed that if I lose uh, my place where I'm supposed to be, I would pinch this, and uh, that would bring me back. Into yes, you can do that. You can do that in the beginning. Later on, it won't be necessary. To start with, you can do it. Yes. And the real struggle um, before you start the exercise and keeping it awake, it's uh, it's a reaction I get usually when I'm closed in like that. It's nice and warm. It's a very relaxing. So when you started the exercise, or rather when I started the exercise, uh, there was a state. There was an altered state of awareness of falling asleep. But this is the first time I've done this exercise. I've done that before. Where I was able to come out of sleep, you know, by I go down and see my eyes going down or bring it back. Um, and yet I don't know; it doesn't matter. I have a feeling that I drifted into sleep several times, maybe six or seven times, but there was a feeling of awareness of going back again, you know. And um, just a couple of times that I was interpreting, it seemed that I was focusing up. It was a real mechanical exercise going on, experience you know, focusing here, but with uh, It was really hard work. I really had to work at it. But it's worthwhile. That hard work is worthwhile. You will find. 
the hard work. The point is, uh, there are other techniques. You are using the technique of looking and finding that the eyes are going down so you would come up. Another technique is, before starting the exercise, to imagine that there is a floor at the level of the eye, a hard floor made of cement or made of steel, and you pound your imaginary feet on it so that you know it's hard. And that consciousness that you have a hard floor here sometimes keeps you awake. The different techniques one can use. I find it sounds so interesting that one way to come back to that kind of flavor was to actually touch here. That's right. You can do it in the beginning, yes. You can do it in the beginning. Uh, you are not alone. The majority of these people here had the feeling of going to sleep. And they had a hard time keeping awake. In fact, I had to say so. So it is not unusual. So what happened is very usual. But little more practice will tell you how not to fall asleep. And then you get more results more quickly here. Yes. Any more questions about the exercise here? Did I miss out anybody? In this exercise, which we just did, we used our everyday common experience of wakefulness to be here. But the thoughts would wander and take us away. We also used a commonplace state of wakefulness of our everyday life to just stay upright and say we are awake. We did not use the tool of imagination too much. Sometimes when you imagine something, you can be in that position according to your imagination. For example, if you imagine that you are sitting on the edge of this table, I don't know if all of you can see this table. Let me take this podium. This corner, the little corner. Can you imagine that you are sitting on this corner? Those who can imagine you are sitting on this corner, please raise your hand. Thank you. Did you see this corner? But you know you can imagine without seeing it all. Okay, now I'll make the exercise simpler. Raise your finger on top like this, top of your head. Can you imagine you are sitting on top of your finger? Those who have imagined, lower your hand. The rest can keep up and still imagine. Imagine you are sitting on top of your own finger. It's imagination. Pure. Were you able to do it? You are not actually sitting there. You imagined you were sitting on top of the finger. What happened when you imagined you were sitting on top of the finger was your attention was drawn to the top of the finger. It's a device. It's a method by which your attention can be taken through imagination. All right. Now we will use this in this next exercise to our advantage. We will imagine we are sitting behind the eyes. Instead of merely trying to focus where we are, we will facilitate our withdrawal and our concentration of attention by imagining that we are sitting behind the eyes at a nice place. And we will imagine that that nice place has a nice chair in which we are sitting. You can, if you like a chair, some people like to sit on the floor, you can sit on the floor. Some people like to sit on a rug. This is the best time to get the most expensive Persian rug. It's free, <laughs> you're imagining it. Or the best possible comfortable chair. Don't have to go to lazy boy. <laughs> you pick up your own chair and put it in the center Imagine the chair is there and you are sitting in it. And by sitting in the chair, you are conscious of that. And this imaginative process of sitting on an imaginary chair draws your attention to yourself. But do not look at yourself sitting in a chair. Please remember this. To draw attention to yourself, you can't create a chair in front of you and say, there I am sitting, a little fellow, a little being, a little person. You can't do that because then you are imagining yourself behind this and looking in front. You cannot see yourself when you sit in a chair. Now you are sitting in a chair, you don't see yourself. You only feel you are in a chair. You can feel the chair, you can feel where you are, your eyes are closed. So you should imagine you are personally yourself sitting in the chair in the center of the head. Imagine you have a nice chair in the center of the head at the eye level, not below it, and you are sitting in it. Clear? Let's begin. Close your eyes and sit comfortably in the chair and keep on imagining you are there. Don't worry what comes in front. Don't look at the patterns in front. Don't chase any 
figures or any faces that come in front. Don't run after thoughts. Put your thought on the chair and the center and you sitting in it. Was the process of imagination of any help? Those who found it helpful, raise your hand. Thank you. Those who had difficulty still of figuring out how to be inside the head, please raise your hand. Those who still had difficulty in figuring out that they were in the head. None. We passed in the first session. We'll continue these exercises and uh, the means of improving our concentration of being in the head after lunch. Yes. Just one question. Uh, I was uh, in the head. But I noticed that uh, it kept tilting and moving, and and and, and I was then became aware that I was trying to get it back into into line, and then sometimes missed the missed the chair. You know what I'm saying? It was interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. So it gives uh, gives some practice. Yeah, but I found my head doing this. It was hard to keep it still. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Keep the chair still. That's more important. Hold on to the chair in the center. Yes. It seems like you're falling asleep that happens. So subtle, like the place, getting in the place where you're up here and then like kind of falling slow. Is, there, is it better to keep trying to be there? Or? Yes. So it's better to keep place. trying because otherwise sleep is one of the easiest ways to get away from it. So even if you, but sometimes I'm not sure if I'm sleeping or not. Like I can't tell if I'm sleeping or not. Uh, when you are not sure, then you should presume you are awake. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you a very simple, simple thing. When you are not sure if you are sleeping or not, it only means that what is happening in front is not what normally happens. And during meditation, a lot of experiences will come which normally don't happen, like flying in a sky. So one, we are so used to this idea that since we don't know where the body is and we are flying in a sky, we must have fallen off to sleep. But it doesn't look like sleep. The sky is blue and the flowers are yellow. We've never seen them in sleep and dream. So it's actually not sleep. But it is not uh, wakefulness in the sense the body has become unconscious. So therefore, when you are not sure, but the scene is very clear, multicolor, don't worry about it still awake. But when you start seeing uh, uh, monocolor dreams, then you're going to sleep. Did you know that we mostly dream in one color? How many of you are aware that 99% uh, of our dreams are only in one color? Not black and white, buff and white, flesh colored and ranges of this. And all the dream sequence takes place with that. Rarely do we come across a dream in which we see sharp blues and yellows and so on. And those are so distinct, it's difficult to forget. They don't wipe out so quickly like we wake up and other dreams just disappear. And these dreams stay on with us because they are at a higher wakeful state that you get them. Anyway, we'll talk of it some uh, time later. Any question immediately on this exercise? Yes. I find that imagination isn't, isn't helpful. I mean, I could begin to imagine myself sitting there and then all of a sudden my ear is as big as Joe. It then that that takes my attention and I think I can sit here more quietly in without know, imagination. Without imagination. Okay. You don't have to use yeah, it. Yeah, because I, I find No. Use what is good for you. Yeah. For centering. Yeah. Remember the purpose is centering and not imagination. That's right. Imagination is a help, not the purpose. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's something interesting. The first time we did the exercise, I found that when you centered it was pretty easy. It then wanted to ray out like like a sun, and I found that my head was the boundary, but I was aware that those rays go way out. And then I said, "No, stay in the middle." And there was no trouble coming back. The second time we did the exercise, since you said make a floor, and it was uh, like a, I the, found that instead of a ray in the center, I found the front hole going up. Was it going this way or this way? First time it was it seemed to actually most people seemed to be from this direction up. Okay, was, don't worry. A, don't set any boundaries this way or this way. No, no. Don't set any boundaries this way. Set the boundaries only this way. Okay, so I could have allowed the funnel just to Absolutely. You'll be amazed how big the space is. It's a huge big sky. 
it looks like it has gone beyond the ears. Even between the ears, there's a huge big sky enough to fly around. Okay, you'll, you'll see that. Any other question? Yes. In order to not look at the self, in, or, in order to not look at myself in the chair, I had to imagine things outside of myself and imagine myself doing things. Exactly. But did you feel the chair on which you were sitting? Yeah. That's fine. You can imagine things, but don't move towards them. Stay back. If you imagine a thing and you feel you're also being drawn by the thing, consciously pull back. Then you'll be in the center. Otherwise, tendency will be to go out from the eyes. When you imagine things outside and you follow them around, you may not be in the center. You may just take your attention out. So long as you pull back your attention to the chair within, the imagined things should be able to help you to see where you are seeing from. That's an aid. But That's... you're not supposed to look at yourself in the chair. No. If you want to see the chair, you can, but don't. Look at the things that come and go. Don't even worry about what is. Don't try to imagine a particular thing. Because our mind is so strong, even if you imagine nothing, some patterns and some things will start coming very soon. We'll see after lunch. You'll see more things coming. Don't follow them. Let them come and go. We, we have a few more minutes for questions at this time. Any questions? Yes. Your turn has come. <laughs> any, any questions, not only on uh, the exercise? Okay. Uh, I realize that uh, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, but when I'm thinking back on uh, this notion of the soul is the listener and the mind is the speaker, and when you do your simran, to have your soul listen to your mind saying the simran. Right. And great master talks about doing your simran. Yes. But then he says, when you, once you hear the sound current, then you should no longer say the simran. Right. What should your mind do if it's no longer saying the Simran and your soul is listening to the shout? You don't have to decide that question if the sound is strong enough to listen. When, supposing you want to listen to Clarence and don't want to listen to me, and Clarence is talking to you and I start speaking and you don't want to listen to him anymore, and he keeps on talking and you're listening to me, it doesn't bother you. He's talking on his own. It is your attention that is shifting from one to the other. So when your attention Listening to your mind doing Simran shifts to your yourself generating the sound current. You, you ignore the mind. And vice versa. If, it, if, you, if your mind drifts from hearing to the sound, you should go back to the Simran. Yeah, if you do not hear the sound, go back to the Simran. I don't have the mind hearing the sound. You hearing the sound. The mind is not a listener. Well, mind is not a listener. Right, right. So if you, you, I, when I say you, I refer to the soul. But you can see, I can listen to the sound and drive a car. Yeah. I mean, I so. Well, if the sound is there all the time, you have to listen to it, whatever you do. But the beauty of this sound is, even when it is very loud, resounding so loudly, you can drop a pin and hear the pin dropping. It doesn't drown that sound. The two are in different dimensions altogether. So, what should your mind, in, in, in your meditation, if you're listening to the sound, you're not driving a car. If, you're, if you want to go within deeper, mm -hmm. and you're listening to the sound. Mm -hmm. Listen intently to the sound. Intently, you mean? Intently mean? How, where is the sound? Is it one sound? Is it a mix? So your mind is asking questions about the sound. Uh, 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 questions, and actually trying to listen to the sound in its variation. So it's okay to have your mind ask questions about the sure, sound that you listen sure. Sure, minds can keep on commenting upon it, asking questions, saying things. That's fine. That sounds good. I like that sound. I don't like that one. You can keep on. So that your mind can start focusing on the sound. Yeah. Focus. Not, not focus. Comment upon the sound. When you say focus, you know, the word focus, are you using the word focus in the same way that I am using the word to comment upon the sound? That means draw the mental attention to the sound. Is that right? Well, um, <laughs> when, I, when I focus, I ask questions. Okay. You can ask questions. About the sound. Yeah. Um, all of these terms are appropriate. Maybe con consider the, the idea of tasting a sound, to savor it. You know what I mean? You know, you transfer from the, you know, from the oral sense to the, to the auditory and kind of try to taste the sound, but really, really taste it as though you were a gourmet in sound. You know? Um, but have you system. been able to distinguish sound that is thick and flavory and the sound that is thin and tasteless. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? No. Why not? But you will find that the sound 
is generating all sense perception. Like uh, he is able to transfer more quickly. That you can see the sound. You can hear the sound. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Now, I don't know that there's really a relationship. Might have been a mental thing for me as a result of some kind of other suggestion. But this is what happens. I do hear the sound, these sounds uh, constantly. Uh, I was just listening to it once and not looking for anything. I was just listening, meditating, if you will. And what I saw was a totally uh, black field of black on which was coming at me in laser lights, images, multiple images that looked just like OM. The Sanskrit letter or word OM. And that like shocked me. I mean, with hindsight, I'm, you know, afterwards I start like evaluating that. Oh, I was seeing the sound um, in its visual representation, or then I was seeing my own mental image pictures of what I would expect the sound should look like if it was visually represented. What was, it, what was kind of a kind She was of... seeing the sound? Even the mental imaging is in sound. It doesn't take away from the process. It is the sound that you see. The light that you see is the sound. So it, and the fact that you the... made it a mental image of OM doesn't make a difference because even at physical levels we see the sound the same way. And at mental level we also see sound the same way. And any mental imagery that we do with the sound is the same thing. So your hindsight was right. The fact that it was a mental imagery doesn't take away from the quality of the sound or its uh, ability well, to be it seen. It's very visual. I was, it I can was be carried visual. watching that yeah. at the same time I was listening. Yeah. But it took me by surprise. And it can also happen that you can, because of the nature of the sound being white, which means sometimes we are so engrossed in other things that the sound is there, we don't listen, like it's happening with many of us. That the nature of the sound is such that we may only see the visual, visual light and forget it is coming with the sound. But actually, it is coming with the sound. All these lights are with the sound. When you listen to the sound and you see the light, you want to just let the light, look at the light and not focus on the light? Yes. Now, if you, when Great Master talks about crossing the stars, the sun, and the moon, do you want to look for the, just look for the stars, the sun, and the moon? Do you want to focus and maybe create, can you imagine that you're making, turning the light into the stars? Don't look for them. Don't focus upon them. Pass by them. They will pass by themselves. You stay in the center with the sound. All these stars and moons and these galaxies will pass by you. So you don't want to focus on these lights. No, no. But you can focus on the, listening to the sound. Listening to the sound. The essential thing is to listen to the sound. Yes. In my meditation, I, I saw the chair. I was feeling the chair and the sound. And then nothingness. Just the inner stillness. This, this was all. Did you like it? Loved it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Keep doing it, you'll see more. More will happen. Yes. If you go to a concert, um, you often experience the music through vibration within the body, right? The body, the temple reverberates. Um, what about just the experiences of the, you can, the, there's the sound of silence, you know, as, as uh, Paul Simon says, um, which is really a sound. It's quite, it's quite vivid, in fact. Right. Go to a mountaintop, you hear it instantly, you can't help it. Um, but you do feel the reverberation. What about the experience of feeling that same reverberation? But any time during the day, oh, yes. hours, it's the same experience. Yes, it's, it's all the time there. Sound is not necessarily auditory. No, no. That's why I was yes. trying to explain. This yes. sound is not to. necessarily that which is heard. It can be, but, but it, 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 goes into, it goes into the feeling of, of vibration, the experience of light. So I try to satisfy myself by using two different words, listening and hearing. But Listening and hearing. Huh? They, we, we, I make a distinction. When it is auditory, I say hearing. And otherwise, I always say listening. Okay. So that's why I say you can listen to see, uh, listen and see the sound. You can listen and hear the sound. It's like, you can listen and feel the sound, the vibrations it's of it. It's like whenever anybody would do a visualization um, exercise and they would say, see something. And I'm, think, I'm not a visual person internally. And so I would never see and I feel left out. <laughs> You know, I didn't see the apple or, or the no, chair. No, that's, not, that's however, not so important. However, not, recently I read something that was fascinating. It said seeing is actually not seeing with the eyes, not visual. Seeing is the experience of the mind. Well, that is true. That is true. It's always known. Seeing has never been with the eyes. Yes. Uh, I had an experience very similar to that 
the only thing that concerns me is that I didn't have any sense of self at all. It's like I, 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 there was a location where I was supposed to be, and there was a sense of comfort in a chair, and I could, that was there, but, and I saw nice colors, and I felt I had a good feeling inside of myself, but I felt that there was no me there. Who was it? I don't, there was nothing there. Uh, but, what, but somebody had a good feeling. It was very. <laughs> no, but but who who had that? <laughs> no. no, but who had that good feeling? Was it you or someone else? I guess. But when I would look where that chair is. <laughs> no, for, forget about the chair. chair. <laughs> forget about the chair. The beautiful colors and the other things that happened. Who saw them? I have to say, it must have been me. But that's okay. like a logical thing to say. But my feeling was. Where is she? Where is she? Yeah. Now, you know why that happened? Because when you say she or I or me, you always refer to the body. Did you know that? Every time you talk to people and lived in this world, you refer to this body. And that was the self. That was the, When you had this experience, it was not the body having the experience. Therefore, you said, where is the self? The self, you are not aware of the self. But actually, that is the self and not the body. It for first time corrected the notion that the body which we have been taking to be the self is not really the self. That was the self which had a good feeling. That is called the self. That's the real you. That's the real self. So that experience shows that was the real you. But it also feels like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> It also feels that you are nothing. <laughs> Maybe it's just schizophrenia. <laughs> no, one. Uh, this is. The body was left out. The ordinary personal eye was left out, right? It's the usual personal eye. Yeah, the usual personal eye is the one associated with the body, and that is why. When this experience happened, uh, we feel that there is the self gone. But later on, as more and more experiences come, many others will say, even that self which had the earlier experience is not there. Eventually, you will find that the self is not a one, one being. Self is an experiencer, a total experiencer. It's not one person. It's not one being. And that's the truth. All of us sitting here are just one self. What doesn't appeal to us now when we are in the bodies and when we are in the astral and causal bodies, we still retain some of our individuation and separation. But eventually we find that there is no real separation. The one that is getting the experience is the same one in all of us. So it's not a very unusual experience to feel that where is the self gone? So don't worry about it. Enjoy the beauty of the show, which takes place inside. Yes. What you just said about, okay, we're all one, but then we all have personalities. Are our personalities created by the mom? Yes, they are. And then once, you, once we get beyond the mom, then we would all behave the same. Then we don't behave. Okay. <laughs> Behavior is created by the mind. Yes. Really, I've been having an experience when I'm sitting outside <laughs> under the stars. I've been having, a, and it started about three weeks ago, where I had a, uh, an imagination of having no top on my head, and there was all these. The, there was no separation between me and the whole universe. And at first, it, I felt like you described a little bit strange, but I but I still felt myself. So it's been going on for a while, and now it's happening more and more and more. But that first, it's the first time I ever had that experience where I was there and I was. I was awake. I wasn't meditating. I was just sitting. I was quiet, but I didn't feel, I felt as though I had no top on my head and that all the stars filled up my whole self. And it was really, it was really something else. I, you liked it? I liked it. Didn't scare you? No. I feel <clears throat> no separation between myself and the universe. That's good. Uh, That's good. And you just mentioned that you were not meditating, yeah. but you were sitting quietly. Yeah. 
by yourself, yeah. sitting quietly by yourself, not saying anything. Yeah. That is called meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so you are meditating. Yes. Uh, the only time I've been able to hear the sound turn is when I plug up my ears. Yeah, it is a help. It, yeah, it, and I'm just wondering if I'm getting, getting addicted to that method and if it's going to be difficult to... No, no. Once you put more attention on the sound, it will be so loud. You don't need any aid to hear it. It's there all the time. It rings all the time. You hear it beautiful. It's so melodious. The, the higher, finer form, because the sound changes. As our consciousness will rise, the quality of the sound will change and become so beautiful, so melodious, so attractive. You like to live with the sound. It's like keeping intoxication. It's like intoxication. It holds me a lot more than just repetition of the mantra. That, that's more important. Repetition of mantra is secondary. Once one gets to the sound, one need not have a mantra. Should I not plug up my ears? Well, if it, you can only hear it with the ears plugged, plug them. When you can hear it without ears plugged, take the plugs off. Okay, then. Any other question? Yes. When we talk about tithing, giving one tenth of your day to spiritual work, if you sit and and you don't really focus, but you can hear, you just listen to the sound current, but it's not like meditating, listening to the sound current. Is that considered tithing? Or when when you get to that point, then the tithing is the actual trying to go within even deeper. Tidings are also of two kinds. One are called the reluctant tidings. <laughs> we give it reluctantly, but we are convinced by the minister, the pastor, the priest, you have to give it. Otherwise, it will be extracted from you in some other form. <laughs> That's the reluctant. Same thing with meditation. We can do reluctant meditation. We have to do it. Let's put the time in. And that is, uh, that's good to satisfy the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is the willingness, the seeking, the intensity with which you are doing it. So therefore, if your heart is not fully into it, Merely mechanically doing it is not too good for the actual meditative process. It's better, than, so it's better than just to sort of let, sit back and enjoy listening to it without trying to really <clears throat> make it come. <laughs> yes, just relax and listen. Relax so, and listen so in, an, in a way in which you enjoy it, and not that you are forcing yourself into it. So the posture then should be the whole thing. It is. Posture can be key in, in such in circumstances. Posture, seems like a lot of work and another posture is easy. Then take the easy posture. If the easy posture does not interfere with the other distraction of sleep. As long as the posture doesn't interfere with sleep in the posture. It's fine. I said in the beginning, each individual wow. can have his own posture and that posture is good, which is comfortable, but does not let us go to sleep. You devise your own posture. Yes. There are masters who um, supposedly have reached the body by using other methods than the sound current, such as karma yoga and so forth. Why do you say that the sound current is the most supreme method? I said the royal style. The I didn't royal, say supreme. The royal. I said royal style, like a king or a queen. You want to go in royal style in a royal coach? This is it. You want to go with other topsy-turvy ways? Go by that. As long as you get there. It does matter. I like the comfortable one. <laughs> <laughs> Why should I choose the other one if there's an option? If there was no option, then I would say I can't help it. Here I find there's an option. If I have the royal road to go or I have the narrow lanes to go, I choose the royal road and drive straight. Yes. Another question about the sound again. Um, it's almost five years to the day it will be soon that, that I became aware of it and it's been constant. Uh, it amazed me the first few times, or the first time in particular, that I flew uh, to, to India, as it was, and <coughs> had a cheap seat, which is my style of flying, and could hear the sound over the jet engines. Uh, I couldn't stop the sound. Uh, and this, you know, uh, amazed me. But what amazed me even more was just a couple of weeks ago, we went to the India Fair in New Jersey. I don't know if, if you've been there. I don't even know if the show's still going on, but it's quite a presentation. Um, there was a special concert. I can't remember the man's she's name. He's cool. world she's, famous. She's he plays the Sun Tour. Say again? She, um, uh, the Sun Tour player. Yeah, plays yeah, the Sun Tour. Great. You know oh, so you okay. Yes, yes. That's, that's him. Yes. And that was the only time in five years that 
I couldn't, while he was playing, that I couldn't find my sound. Uh, it, it either disappeared into the music or the music or his vibrations were neutralizing it or stopping it. Uh, it's as though my sound wasn't there. It got interrupted or blanked out. Would you comment on it? Because it's the only... only yes, it uh, just fitted in with the notes of his music at that oh, time. Perfectly, but the whole time he was playing, I don't know if it was the, if the scruffy, the underlying tone is what got... Yes, the un underlying the tone, yes. Because in the santur, that musical instrument, that the underlying tone of that which keeps going can be so similar that the two can merge and you were attributing to him the sound that you were still listening. Do you understand the point? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, <laughs> yeah. I so the sound never stopped. The sound never stopped. And but during that... I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah, because you were attributing to him at that time and his music, the sound that never stopped. What's the relationship between the sound current and the numbness in the body? When the, when the body becomes numb uh, because of withdrawal of attention, then the sound is normally more audible. Well, yes. The posture that you get in to listen to the sound current, you feel that your body numbs out quicker than when, when, when you relax in another posture. But then that posture that you're listening with, you, you experience some discomfort. Could you try to, to get beyond the discomfort of that posture because you've, you've got the numbness? No, it's not. Uh, the numbness is of two kinds. A numbness that you are aware of. If you sit too long uh, on, on one foot, the foot becomes numb and heavy. And you can't feel, have the feeling if you touch any part of the foot, but you are aware of the foot as a whole. That's the numbness that can come by pressure. And there's another numbness. You don't know where the foot is. You are unaware of it. The meditational numbness that comes by concentration of attention is of the second kind. Well, I, I'm unaware of everything when I read a book. I mean, you know, I'm unaware of my body. Is that numbness? Well, if you're unaware of the body, that's the kind of numbness we're talking of. Well, I read a good book. I mean, if you focus on a book, your, your body's numb that, right? Yes, if, uh, not for everybody. It can happen with you, but not with everybody. Some people can concentrate their attention so much on one thing, they forget their body and, and they become unaware of their body. But it's a, it's a varying experience with different people. It's not uniform. Like I am telling you my own experience that I was meditating with the mantra, with instructions for several years with a small error in the technique that kept me back and I didn't know it. The small error that I made was that before closing my eyes and starting the meditational practice, I would not imagine that I am there and just start off. With the result, the feeling of the floor, the feeling of the room in which I was meditating continued into the meditational technique I couldn't get out of. And once I changed that, after I was corrected on this by my master, he corrected this as an error to just close your eyes and say you are in meditation and continue to have all the rest of the environment as part of your opening consciousness. And once I found that this was not correct, the correct thing was to go into the head and be there and be conscious of being inside, then start the meditation. It worked so far. It made a big difference. You will notice these workshops that I have styled here to introduce you to the uh, royal style of meditation, these workshops are nothing but a preparation based upon what I learned by error. So some things we learn by trial and error. And the purpose of the meditational workshop there in Mekwan will be that we may have been meditating for a long time and didn't know this is where we were going wrong slightly. And it kept us back. So it will be worthwhile for those who are already meditating and for those who have just started meditating but it is not an uh, opener's workshop just to learn about meditation. So those who are meditating and practicing in different kinds are welcome. Thank you very much. We now have a lunch break.